Hi, Steve here at BlessedHopeForever.com. God is everywhere. Now, you would think that, at least in the minds of most Christians, that would be sort of a given. Uh, well, Steve, I know that God is everywhere, so what? I'd like to talk a little bit about His omnipresence. I may touch on a few other uh, of His attributes, but uh, primarily this video is going to be about His omnipresence. One of His three main attributes, uh, omnipotence, all-powerful, omniscience, all-knowing, uh, omnipresence, uh, He's everywhere. First of all, God exists, and, and that God has a relationship with His people. If He has no relationship, the, well, then the existence of God makes no sense. And if there is no God, a relationship makes no sense. And if both don't exist, there is no study of God. Secondly, man has a religious nature. And along with that nature, he has the capacity to think and to reason, uh, which is not true of any other living, breathing creature. And in addition to that, his reasoning ability makes him capable of comprehending and understanding facts. Uh, my horse is not very good at, at that, uh, though I try to get him to be. It's also true that a means of communication exists uh, between God and man, and that means is, in fact, His Word, uh, as well as the Holy Spirit. And, and based uh, on those uh, three facts, we begin this look at His omnipresence. I, I want to look, first of all, at the way God reveals Himself. Uh, bear in mind, one of our our facts not open to argument in this discussion is that the Word of God is the revelation of God and He reveals Himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's the first thing that we really ought to look at. So I want to talk about one of His attributes, His omnipresence. Uh, the Word of God reveals that our God is eternal. Uh, he had no beginning. That's a concept that's extremely difficult for the human mind to grasp. But it's true, you know, it's, it's kind of like, like where we sit around and, you know, and we say, well, you know, if, uh, if space uh, isn't infinite, uh, what does the edge look like? And when we got to the edge, what does it look like on the other side of the edge? And we'd float all kinds of theories around trying to come up with a an answer all the time forgetting the fact that we as finite creatures haven't got a chance on earth comprehending infinity. I know I've sat around trying and uh, it was pretty much a waste of time. We also have a great difficulty in dealing with zero and the sad fact concerning some of these difficulties is that many people have concluded that they'd rather worship a God called chance than they would a God who reveals Himself as He does in His Word. And so, that's what we want to look at. How does God reveal Himself? Well, He reveals Himself as eternal. He was there in the beginning. He created the heavens and the earth. He spoke them into existence. There was nothing before God. God always was. One of His other attributes is omniscience. Uh, God is omniscient. That is, He's all-knowing. That's, that's not as difficult, I guess, for many people to comprehend. However, they sure like to wrestle with God's omniscience. He doesn't have anything to do with you but because He's so smart. He knows ahead of time what you're going to do. You know, and pe folks never stop to consider where that reasoning process is taking them. So tonight, our subject is His omnipresence. 
that God is omnipresent. There are, there are many passages of Scripture, uh, probably more than I have time to, to, to look at, to read. And your interpretation of those verses may be as good as mine. We call that hermeneutics, the process of trying to figure out what the text means. We know what it says, but what does it mean? And the meaning that you gl glean from a verse, you know, from any verse, may be different than mine. I'm suggesting in this discussion that you can't do that. You can't take any Scripture and conclude that God is not eternal. You can't take any verse of Scripture and conclude that God is not all-knowing. And you, you certainly can't take any Scripture and conclude that God is not omnipresent. And you know, and we could just we could spend hours or days just looking at indications in the Word of God that God is omnipresent. I want to look at a few. First Kings chapter eight, verse twenty-seven. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Question mark. Behold the heaven and 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 the heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house that I have built. You know, or the context there being uh, King, King Solomon and the temple. How could the Lord dwell in this temple if He dwells in all the earth? Even the heavens can't contain Him, for He's omnipresent. Psalm 139, verse 8, of course, is the classic passage. I'll read only a few verses, uh, 7 through 12. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. God is omnipresent. In addition to this, in many other passages of Scripture, we do have the possibility of using our brains that God gave us. If there is some place that God isn't, then God isn't God. If there's any place that God isn't, then God's not God. If, there, if there's some place that God doesn't control, that God doesn't inhabit, that God doesn't know, that would not be God. Also, uh, reason, uh, sound reasoning would, would say that since He's all-powerful, and, we, and we, we haven't really looked at His omnipotence yet, but we may, if Lord willing, if He's all-powerful, then there's no limit on that power. Yet if there is some place where God isn't, then there's that place where His power is limited, and by that much, God becomes less than God. Reason would also suggest that, that God spoke the heavens and the earth into existence. He's the one who created, so He surrounded that which He created, and He surely filled that which He created suggesting that there is nothing in His creation where He isn't. Now, I believe that these attributes are revealed in the Word of God for our comfort. I don't think God gave us this revelation and, and infused it with these facts concerning Himself just because, just because He wanted to do that. There is surely a purpose in His Word, and that purpose is for us. One of, the, one of the great problems I see in modern Christianity is its willingness to incorporate humanism and suggest that the Scriptures are, are something like a rule book by which we're to live rather than a revelation of God Almighty. It's astounding how Scriptures are quoted. You know, let him that is without sin cast the first stone as the only, only sinless uh, people can cast stones. No sense having law. We might as well throw it out. 
It isn't about the character of those who are doing the judging, but the law that is the standard by which one is judged. You know, it's amazing how Scripture is quoted out of context. You all know an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. and You know, just about every Christian can quote that, half, halfway quote that verse. You know, Lord have mercy, what terrible vengeance. I mean, you know, what a silly thing to say. All that, all that verse says, folks, is that you're entitled to how much I damage you. That's justice. But the world views justice today as, well, you know, you're not only entitled to how much I damage you, but, but, but $3 million more, you know, for all your mental anguish or some other thing. Folks, I think the Scriptures are profound. If I take out your eye, it wasn't your fault. You know, what's, so what's that worth? Well, ask me what my eye is worth. And that's what it's worth. You know, if I do that, maybe I, sh I ought to be willing to lose my eye. It is, in fact, justice, not revenge. Revenge is what we have today, it seems. Well, anyway, that's the way the Scriptures are used, and that's not the purpose of the Word of God. The book is a revelation of God, and it's there that that revelation might be meaningful to us. So... God reveals Himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, there's no reason for that. The only possible reason you can put forth is your redemption. If God was not concerned with your redemption, there would be no reason to give us that revelation of Himself. But for page after page, we have the revelation of our God and and how man refuses to believe Him. How man refuses to follow Him. And so He redeemed us by one man's disobedience. Many were made sinners. Even so, by the obedience of the one shall the many be made righteous. And we have what are supposed to be thinking individuals sitting around saying, well, that's only true if you accept Him. And then I always say, well, I'm thrilled to know that because that means I'm only made a sinner in Adam if I accept that. So, and I don't, I don't believe I was made a sinner in Adam. So, you know, that's how that goes. That's what reason would tell me. If I, ha if I have to accept the righteousness in Christ, then, well, then why don't I have to accept the unrighteousness in Adam? And you can't do that to that verse of Scripture. The beauty of God revealing Himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the grand revelation that He loves us and that He's concerned about us and that His purpose is our redemption. That's why we have the Word of God, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Astounding that that, that is clearly the purpose of this book. And yet people use it to add lay guilt and despair on you. Responsibilities that God never intended nor equipped that you bear. Well, what do I have to do? I mean, I've tried to, to fulfill the law and I can't. And they, they go on and on and on about how I should, well, you, just, you ought to just try harder. That's like pouring gas on the fire. And so the Bible becomes a burden rather than a marvelous revelation that the great concern of the God of all time, the God of eternity, the monarch of the ages, and the creator of the heavens and the earth loves me and He reveals Himself as my Redeemer. And God is eternal. God is revealing Himself to us as a God who does not change Hebrews 13, let your conversation be without covetousness. You know, when we look at the law, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all uh, thy mind, with all thy strength, thy neighbors, thyself. You know, one, you know, one might argue, well, I, you know, I've done that. I don't, I don't think you have, but you could argue that. 
And you could argue through the laws. You know, I, I haven't borne false witness and I haven't committed murder and I haven't committed adultery. And, but then you, you get down to thou shalt not covet. And well, you know, it, it'd be nice if that one wasn't there. And suddenly people stand condemned under the law, which is true. That's why God reveals Himself as Redeemer, the most, the most precious, precious word in the Christian's vocabulary is Redeemer. And that's what He is. Let your manner of life be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have for he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now, I, su I suppose some of you here know the verse that precedes this, the, that marriage is honorable in all and the bed is undefiled. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with, with the wife that you have or the husband. Now, that's only part of the syntax. I'm sure it includes other things so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me for Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the context in which that verse is found. And we sing it in hymns. But the comfort is that, that He doesn't change. He's eternal. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today. He's the same forever. His love is not going to change. His grace is not going to change. His compassion isn't going to change. His comfort isn't going to change. His truth isn't going to change. He's the absolute eternal God. He's omniscient. So He knows the end from the beginning. And He knows us. Isaiah 46, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my will. If you have the authorized version, all my pleasure. God's going to do what God wills. He works all things after the counsel of His own will, but in His all-knowing, we realize that He knows us. He's without father, without mother, without beginning, without ending. He abides as our priest continually. And He said unto me in the book of Revelation, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. For he knoweth our frame. And he remembers that we are dust in his omniscience. We're not hiding anything from God. He knows every single last minute detail about us. He knows every single thing about us, about what we do, about what we think. And He loves us with an everlasting love. There is comfort in His omniscience. Lord, I don't know why, I don't know when, and I don't know how, but I know a God who does know why. I know a God who does know when. I know a God who does know how. It's because we don't recognize the attributes of our God that we live with the sense of an abstract, an abstract God who has little to do with each moment of our lives. But he, but he does. And I praise the Lord for His omniscience and that He knows all about me as bad as I am and still loves me. He's omnipresent. He's, he's, he's everywhere. There isn't any place God isn't, but we don't feel that way. You know, we pray to God in heaven. We, you know, we read verses of Scripture. God came down to the Garden of Eden, you know, must not have been there before, and said, you know, Adam, where are you? Now, he never said, Adam, he never said, Adam, where are you? Because he didn't know where Adam was. The problem was Adam didn't know where Adam was. And of course, God uses a language that's accommodated to our reasoning process. He's the God who came down from heaven but was already here. 
He's the Christ who ascended up to the Father in heaven, but stayed here. He's always here. He's always in our midst. He dwells within us, but we don't feel that way. And the thing that destroys the wonder of the, of the omnipresence of God is sin. Adam and Eve knew of, of no separation from God. They were in blissful communication with Him. How, how, how was that possible? How'd they do that? You know, they didn't dial 1-800 and ask for God. You know, God was always there, communicated with them, and all of a sudden something happened and Christians say, well, well that was a will that exercised itself against the, the will of God. And that's what drove the wedge. Folks, the Bible doesn't say that. We have hymns, you know, like, that we want a closer walk with Thee when we couldn't be any closer. Oh, Pastor Steve, wouldn't you like to be closer to Christ? And I, I tell them I couldn't be. And there's this long pause. And I say, He dwells within me. How could I be any closer? Well, Pastor, most people feel that they would like to be closer to the Lord. Well, most people don't understand His Word then. And they just walk away. Dearly beloved, don't run your Christian life on emotion. You know, I don't feel very close to the Lord. I don't care how you feel. What are the facts? Well, the facts are He's right there. Moses was concerned about the commission given to him for directing the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and he did what most of us did. You might as well put it in modern language. He didn't want, he didn't want to do the job. Didn't, he didn't feel capable of doing the job. You know, you could say, well, he, Steve, he was humble. He wasn't. He, was, he wasn't trying to be overly humble, he recognized the magnitude of the commission being given to him and his incapacity to do that. And so he prayed to the Lord and said, show me what's going to happen. And that's what every one of us would like. God is omniscient. Show me what's going to happen. God said, I'm going to show you what's going to happen. But in, in Exodus 33, he says, my presence shall go with you. That's the omnipresence of God. He's with you. Behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Those were words of comfort that He gave to His disciples. And those words apply to us. We just only feel that He's far away. But He's here. He is never, ever separated from you. Minister after minister works out sermons mostly from Old Testament Scriptures for what separates you from God. You know, and He's no longer with you. Not true. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Ah, but somebody says, you know, well, you can leave Him. Wow, you, that, so you can run faster than God. You know, he said he'd never leave you, but that's, that's conditioned on you doing. No, it's not. What gives you the right to put conditions on something that God doesn't? Where can you insert in the verse that God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you if you whatever, if you do certain things? You know, you could be lying in the gutter someplace, folks, and God is there. God is there in your every thought. God is there in your, in your work. Everything we do, we do with God. And it's comforting to know that He's there. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in His sight, but all things are naked and open before the eyes of Him with whom we have to deal, seeing then that we have such a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. 
He ascended up into heaven, folks, but He's here. He dwells within us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He knows the way we take because we have a high priest who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, who is in all points tempted like as we are, yet separate from sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace and find grace to help in time of need. If Jesus Christ died in your place, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight, because He's omnipresent, the Lord said, be not afraid. I am with you to save you, to deliver you, to direct you, to guide you, to comfort you. I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. I think the omnipresence of God is one of the most comforting attributes that God has. If we look at His justice and His holiness, we're stunned with the realization that we cannot meet those demands until we look at Christ who died in our place. You know, to think that God is always with us. Just imagine that nothing can touch you. Nothing can touch your life that God doesn't approve of. You don't really need to fight your battles. He's with you every step of the way. He won't forsake you, and He loves you. He loves you with an eternal love. The eternal, all-knowing, all-present God is our Redeemer, and I want you to know that. So God's omnipresence is not just a theoretical conclusion. It is a precious truth of redemption. Although we have sinned and we deserve God's judgment, God comes to His faithful people and He declares to them, I will be with you. This means that God is here wherever we are, but also that God is on our side. He's with us, not to destroy us, but to forgive and to save us from sin. So this with you, this, this redeeming divine presence is found often in Scripture as His gracious promise. To Isaac, God said, I will be with you and will bless you. Genesis chapter 26. And that language often forms the basis of God's redemptive covenant. The heart of the covenant. God's redemptive promise is that I will be your God and you will be my people. A, a precious togetherness of God with His people. God's omnipotence is His control over all things. His omniscience is His authority to declare what is true. And His omnipresence is His real existence in every time and place. So when we talk about God's omnipotence, His omniscience, and His omnipresence, we are talking about His Lordship. God can't be contained in a building. Solomon said as much, in the dedication of the first temple in Jerusalem. Today, God dwells among His people and in His people wherever they are and wherever they go. God cannot be localized to some specific area or location. God can't be reduced to an image or a statue. He is always present whether we believe it or not. He is present even in your worst moments of life. Pain, sickness, sorrow, anger, grief, bitterness, divorce, betrayal, murder, cancer, AIDS, abortion, warfare, famine, earthquakes, fires, floods, I, every natural disaster, doesn't matter. He's there. Even at the moment of death. He's always available to us wherever we go. We always have His full attention. We don't have to make an appointment. His presence, dearly beloved, is like the air that we breathe. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.